Thank you. Thanks very much, Piotr. Um, so my presentation today is called The Secrets of Successful Development. And what I'll be aiming to do is to provide you with as much value as I possibly can. Um, I'll be aiming to provide you with some insights into the approach that we take to development, to property development, what's worked for us. And I'll be supporting that with some practical examples of the way that we've actually implemented the, the principles that we use to enhance value on development sites. So um, a little bit about me. Um, I've been in property for uh, over 25 years. Um, I started Mount Holmes 17 years ago in 2002, and in that time we've built over 100 properties in London, Gloucestershire and Kent with end values of over £22 million. Um, we've also built up an investment property portfolio of uh, 50, over 50 um, commercial and residential properties. Um, we're currently working on four projects with end values of over £60 million, and I'll be talking about some of those in a minute. These are some of the projects that we've, um, we've completed previously. That's the conversion of the Lock Warehouse in Gloucester Docks. We completed that in 2013. It's a Grade 2 listed Victorian former grain warehouse that we converted into 26 flats with 3,000 square feet of commercial space on the ground floor. That is the Lock Penthouse, and we actually sold that for the highest value ever achieved for a flat in the docks. And I'll talk about the approach that we take to property development, and I'll talk about how we maximise the properties that we, that w the value of the properties that we develop. That's a good example of what those philosophies achieve. This is a development that we've recently completed in Hythe and Kent. It's a new build of, um, of six flats, very contemporary, designed by an architect called Guy Holloway. We've raised over three million pounds in equity for our current projects, and we've crowdfunded around two million pounds of that. Um, and so crowdfunding and, and, and use of equity is an important um, part of our strategy now. It's something that we've only started to do in the last couple of years. Um, we plan to raise a further five million pounds of equity in the next six months, and those are on some of the, some of the projects that we're working on at the moment. So a little, a little bit of a background on me. Um, as I said, I've got over 25 years experience in property. I'm writing a book. It's called Getting It Up. It's about building things. <laughs> But you won't forget the title, will you? Um, it's about the, the methods that we use to deliver profitable property development projects, and I'll be talking about some of those today. Um, there's a couple of philosophies that we use, one called rigorous risk management, and the other one is called design-led development. Um, in, in, in a very brief summary, rigorous risk management is about identifying all the risks on a project before we even buy the project, and doing what we can to reduce or ameliorate those risks. Um, we also take, and, and that's, that's, we use the experience that we've built up over 17 years of, of development to do that, but we also have a framework for dealing with issues that we haven't come across. And so while we've come across most issues that you would come across on a development, I think on every development I do, I come across something that I've not dealt with before. And so you, you, need, you need a framework to deal with those things. Design and development is about focusing on inspired contemporary design to maximise the value of the properties we develop. So that's about design that makes properties attractive externally, but it's also about maximising the spaces within the, the properties. So reducing circulation, um, maximising bedrooms and kitchen sizes, the areas that people actually use, but also focusing the specification of those properties on the people that are going to buy them. And that relies on market research, really, understanding who the buyers are going to be for those particular properties in, in a particular area, and focusing the specification on what those buyers are looking for. So we combine those two philosophies to um, achieve value enhancement on our projects. And actually, that value enhancement is led by design. There's an analytical process that we go through at the back end, which is really about how we appraise sites. But in fact, what we end up managing to do is we, we reduce risk on projects by enhancing the value. So we build in more margin for error on them by enhancing the value before we even start. So I'm aiming to launch the book by the end of 2019. Um, I also do a couple of other things. If you're interested in, in keeping an eye on what I'm doing and, and where I'm doing it, I, I appear on Property TV. I do something called Property Developers Question Time. I also appear on a, a program they do called Property Question Time. Um, I do a, a YouTube vlog. It's called The Main Thing. That will also be going out on Property TV. And really what that's about is sharing some of the insights that we have developed over 17 years of doing property development into the different aspects of, of development. Development's a very wide field, there's a, there's a lot of different topics in there. And so I talk about that, but I'm also interview people in property, 
But I guess I see property development as a form of entrepreneurship. In essence, if you start a property business, really any kind of property business, you're starting a business and so you are an entrepreneur. And so there's also a bit of a focus on, on entrepreneurship in those blogs. So I'm not just inter interviewing people in the property fields, I'm also in interviewing entrepreneurs and people with an insight into entrepreneurship because that's just something that I have a keen interest in. But also, I think by understanding what other entrepreneurs do and how they achieve what they do, it gives you an insight into things that you could do in your own business or, or, or the, the factors that lead entrepreneurs to succeed. Um, so the other thing, I guess, if you want to keep an eye on what I'm doing is um, I do post a lot on social media. Um, probably the main place that I, I'm posting is on Instagram, so you can either follow me or, or Melt Holmes, um, but I'm also on Facebook, LinkedIn, and a little bit on Twitter. Um, so to focus on secrets of successful development, I think the first thing that I want to say is development is difficult. Now, a lot of people think that um, developers just simply go out and buy something, they build something and that process is very easy and then there's, a, there's, a, there's an easy path towards sales. You make a lot of money out of it. Development is a very profitable business. Um, it, is, it certainly isn't that easy and, and actually those who, nothing could be further from the truth if you, if you regard it as, as, as being a very simple process. There's an immense amount of detail involved in doing development and I think people who sort of jump from doing a refurb to actually doing a new build or doing a a conversion of a building into flats will suddenly find that there's an immense number of things that they hadn't even realized that they needed to know about when they jump into a project. And so the other thing I like to say about development is development is detail. There's an immense amount of detail that goes into every development project. And so actually, if you want to learn how to do development, my view is that the best way to do it is by working with somebody that's done it. Um, there's a lot of training courses out there, and they can be useful, they can be helpful, they can give you a framework. But um, I think my view with development is it's a bit like learning to ride a bike. Uh, you can't learn to ride a bike by reading a book. You can get some, some insight into how to do it, but the only way that you really learn how to do it is actually by doing it. And as with riding a bike, the more development you do, the better you get at it. Obviously it's a bit, it's a bit more complex, but, but ultimately it's an art, not a science. And so um, I think, that when it comes to development, because there's so much detail involved in it, planning and preparation is key. So I, I like to say that 90% that, that of the work on the development is done before you even start work on site. I think if you end up having to deal with uh, issues that you could have dealt with before you started, while you've got works going on on site, and that's going to be a very busy period, then you're just not going to have time to deal with them. And the issue that that can cause is if you're halfway through a development and, a, and an issue comes up that you haven't dealt with or that you could have dealt with before work start on site, um, that you can end up delaying your project. And if you're halfway through a project and you've spent half of what it costs to actually build the thing, you're almost certainly financing that with development finance. That's going to be very expensive for you. So not only is it going to delay completion of the project, but it's going to cost you money because you're going to be paying interest on a half-built project, and you can't do anything with a half-built project. You can't do anything with it until it's actually finished, ready to, to, to sell or refinance. So I think the principle for me with development is think slowly and act quickly. Um, I think there's a temptation, and it's a temptation that I certainly fell into when I started doing development, to want to start work on a property as soon as you acquire it. That can, that can be a mistake, because if you, if you don't get everything lined up so that the project runs smoothly, then you can find yourself, again, halfway through and ending up having to deal with things that you just don't have the time to deal with or that perhaps would take some long period of time to deal with. So a good example of this is, um, and these can be things that you don't know about, so a good, good example of this is um, a road on development sites. I don't know, how, how many of you have ever built a, um, a, a road on a development site? Anyone here? Okay, all right then. <laughs> so one thing, if you've never built a road that you, you probably don't know, you might know, I don't know, is that if you build a development with more than five houses in it, then that road will have, will have to be adopted, or you'll have to enter into some sort of negotiation with a highway authority over adoption. Now, nobody will tell you that, if you don't know it. So that one of the benefits of experience with development projects is that if you, um, you know, you might buy a site, 
with a planning permission for 10 houses, you might start building the road. What will happen is if you haven't gone through the road adoption process, the Highway Authority will come and slap something called an APC notice on you. It's an advanced payment code notice. It'll require you to lodge a fairly significant bond with them. And effectively what will happen is that, that if you don't comply with that process, you'll end up simply being held up in their very lengthy approval processes. So that's a good example of something you can get caught with on a development site if you don't know what you're doing. And there are 101 things that can catch you on a development in that way, and the larger the developments get, the more things there are that can catch you. And so this principle of thinking slowly and acting quickly, it becomes more important the larger projects that you do. So if you want to scale up in terms of development, you, need, you do need to be focusing on planning and preparing it in advance. But I think that thinking slowly is about getting everything ready to go so that you've got a, a fully formed project plan and when you push the button you can just run as quickly as you can. Another principle that I think is worth talking about is that everybody, everybody always thinks their property is worth more than it is. Um, what do I mean when I say that? People clearly want to maximise the value of a property they sell, the value of a development site and what is al almost always the case is that when a property first comes to market that the asking price is higher than it's really worth. I mean, most people don't put their, their properties on the market for less than they really think it's, they're worth. They put them on the market for more, thinking, well, somebody can make me, a, me an offer and it'll, it'll, it'll come down to the level that I'm actually asking for. But what that means is that when somebody first puts a property on the market, it's probably not worth chasing it around. In fact, where you, where you tend to find value is on sites that have been sitting around for some long time because it's on those sites that the vendor's expectation has been adjusted to a reasonable level. I think it's important to say that with property development, you make your money to a large extent when you buy the site. Um, not just necessarily in terms of the price that you pay, but also what the opportunities are that are contained within that site. And I'll come on to that in a minute. So I think it's worth saying, straightforward sites sell quickly, difficult sites hang around. And what I'm trying to say when I say this is that if a site is perfect, then it's more attractive to buyers. It's more likely to be overpriced actually because it's simple. And for me, a lot of the value in development can be find, found in finding sites which have issues on them that nobody else has managed to solve. So if there's a problem and you can find a solution to it and you can, you can solve that problem cost effectively, or even better, if you can turn that problem into some form of opportunity, then you can unlock value that somebody else hasn't been able to see. And for me, that really is, is, is the nub of successful development and it's really the key to our strategy in terms of um, our approach to buying development sites. So it's about seeing something that somebody else has missed. And I think to summarise this really, I guess I use a very simple metaphor. Is this a problem? Or, or is it an opportunity? So, you know, what do you do when something's broken? You just throw it away? Or, or do you look for something else that you can do with it? And so, I think, what Cook was talking about earlier on in terms of mindset is very important. Um, if you have a negative mindset in property development, and, and by the way, an over-optimistic mindset is probably also dangerous. You need to be realistic about things. But what you do need to be able to do is keep your mindset level so that you can see opportunities when they exist. I think if you get if you're too optimistic, if you're too emotional about things, or, or even too negative, too emotional about things then you're not able to be logical. And I think in business, it's incredibly important to be focused and logical and think through things and not be, not, and not be swayed and affected by your emotions. And I think that's one of the, the real keys of success in business generally, but certainly in terms of property development. So um, what I want to talk about is how we have engaged that philosophy on a couple of sites that we're working on at the moment. And one of them is a, a development that we're working on in Gloucester. It's called Lime Grove. It's, um, this, is the, this is the site plan for the development when we bought it. So we bought it with an, an outline planning permission. And that outline planning permission was for construction of 12 new built houses. These are the envisaged houses here. And the conversion of this building, the school building, um, which is about 6,000 square feet into two large semi-detached units. And so that original outline planning envisaged those 12 houses and a total of 12,000 square feet, 12,500 square feet of development. I don't know if you know what an outline planning consent is. For those who don't, I'll explain it. Essentially, an outline planning consent is something that establishes the principle that you can build on the site. So this establishes the principle that you can build 12 houses, 
but so well, ten, 10 houses, so effectively 10 new built houses, and then the conversion of this into two large semi detached units. But it doesn't establish the details. In other words, it doesn't establish the detailed floor plans, the materials, the precise size and volume of those houses. I think the point for me is if this building is 6, 000, is, is um, sorry, it's 3,000 square feet, we've got 12,500 square feet approved. So that means that you've got 10 houses, which are a total of 9,500 square feet. So that's, that's 10 houses of 950 square feet each. Now, those are not large houses. Those are, those are three bed terraced houses. And it's quite clear that on a site like this, you're going to be able to support houses that are much larger than three bed terraced houses. So the first thing that's quite obvious is that this outline consent envisages much smaller houses that can really be obtained. Um, so the first thing that we did is put in an outline plan, a, a, a reserve matters application, and that's what you put in to convert an outline consent into, into a detailed consent, in other words, one that you can build. And so we put in much larger houses. We kept the, the uh, school building as being converted to two large single detached units because this from our point of view is relatively non-controversial. And what we achieved with that is we achieved the same 12 houses, but 18,500 square feet. So we paid £725,000 for the site. This, out, this, this reserve mass consent enhanced the value of the site to £1.1 million because essentially we would increase the amount of space available on the site. And so one of the reasons that I like sites with outline consents, especially if it's a, an outline consent where, where the details are a little bit vague, is that there's often an opportunity to actually get more square footage on a, on a site than might be, con might be cons envisaged. What we then did is we then put in two further applications. One was to convert the school building into seven flats, as you suggested, so obviously that's not very good use of that space. Um, there's not really much for large semi-detached units. If somebody wants a large, um, if somebody wants something that's, that's, that's that sort of size, they're actually, I think, 1,700 square feet each, so I think the school's actually 3,250 3, square feet then they're going to buy a detached house. They're not going to be interested in buying something that's semi-detached. There's also obviously quite a large garden area here behind the, um, the school that could be used. Um, and what we also did is we, we managed to agree with the council's arboricultural officer that we could remove this tree in return for a contribution of £20,000 towards tree planting elsewhere in Gloucestershire. So we did look at moving the tree. Uh, it would have been three years, it would have cost us £200,000 that wouldn't have been economically viable. So um, it is quite difficult to get permission to remove arboricultural trees, but it is something that you can sometimes do. And by, by, by doing that, we were, un unable, we were able to unlock the value of these two additional plots here. And so what we ended up with is we ended up with 12 houses, total 12 houses and seven flats, and that gives us 20, almost 25,000 square feet of the diamond site. And so by doing that, We've enhanced the site value from the £725,000 that we paid for it up to £1.35 million. We've also enhanced the end values of the properties that we're developing from around about three and a half million up to more like £7 million. So clearly that creates a lot more margin in the site and by doing that actually we, we de-risk the development. We give ourselves much more margin for error in terms of um, developing the site. So one practical example um, of, of somewhere that we've employed that design-led philosophy and um, that approach to risk, man uh, risk reduction. This is another project that we're currently um, working on. So we acquired this site in, um, so we exchanged contracts to buy this site in April. Um, this is Europe Depot in um, Kennington in East W9. And the existing consent is for the construction of 32 flats on uh, a, a transfer deck, so in other words, uh, effectively a foundation on stilts. Um, on, you know, on, on steel beams over the existing commercial premises. This is the consent that the site has at the moment, and there are a few issues with the current consent. But again, um, is there anything that sticks out to somebody, to, to anyone who's actually looking at that? The thing actually that was most obvious to me is this. Certainly, you've got an opportunity for a basement. I mean, there's, um, it's unusual to see a large-scale development in London go ahead without a basement being put in. But in particular, um, if you look at the... The, the improved consent, you can see the eight to four ceiling lights in some places are higher than they need to be. But also, in particular, on the ground floor, you've got a very high floor ceiling height. Turns out there's no particular reason why that needs to be so. 
And so, in, so in think what you can do is you can accommodate additional floor space within the existing improved depot or the existing improved massing simply by compressing the floor ceiling heights a level and getting another floor in. <coughs> The, the consent that was approved envisaged Europe car using, you, they're the existing tenant, the, the ground floor space for car parking. Now obviously that's not the best use of um, ground floor space in London. Car parking will value ground uh, space that's maybe £10 a square foot, whereas in a location like Kennington you can be looking at £35 to £45 a square foot for say office use, maybe a little bit less for, for say food retail. So the point is that, that the value of that space is not being maximised by the existing consent. And so it was immediately obvious to us when we looked at this site that there was significant potential for enhancement. So what we've actually done is we've submitted a scheme. Um, we actually, rather than looking at a, as a, at a residential use, I think the, the residential use is our fallback, we started looking at alternative uses with a particular focus on commercial. And so we've signed heads of terms with uh, a major apart hotel operator called Safe City to put in a 165 bed apart hotel. If we get the planning permission that we're seeking, we will have them on the upper floors, around about half of the ground floor. We've got subject planning offers from three retail operators for the remaining space on the ground floor. And then Europe Car want a small office on the ground floor and the basement for parking. So that's what the proposed scheme would look like. Um, and what it would enable us to do is actually put a link between the um, the front elevation and the back elevation because with hotel use you don't require the same amount of amenity space as you do with residential so we can actually get additional floor space in there because it's a different type of use. Um, that's what the um, front elevation of the proposed scheme will look like. We've actually got an additional floor that we're looking to get consented so your point about airspace. Um, and, but the point about it is if you look at the front elevation from the street you can't actually see it and so I guess the view that, that you, you put to the planners is this, if you can't see it, it doesn't exist. Sometimes, they take it, sometimes they'll, they'll take it on board, sometimes they won't. So we've got no guarantee of getting that, that's what it would look like from the front elevation, but even b with, with, by using the floor space that we've got within the existing approved massing, there's a significant opportunity for enhancement of the current scheme. But in terms of those uses which I, which I, um, which I covered before, um, if we uh, secure the payment consent that we're, we're looking for, it will have a, a, a quite a significant impact on the value of the scheme. So the gross development value of the consented scheme is around about 23 million. That would yield a profit of around about 16% on cost. So it works based on the commission that we're acquiring it with, but it doesn't work very well. And from our point of view, that's a fallback position. So that's not a permission that we'd want to implement, but it's something that we've got and it, and it gives us a fallback position in, in the event that we're not able to secure any enhancements. If we get all the enhancements we're looking for, then actually we'd, look, we'd be looking at a gross development value of, of well over 50 million, um, and uh, that would give us a residual site value of around about 22 million. So, so in fact, what we'd do in that scenario is we'd forward fund the site, we'd sell, effectively sell the, the site to an investor, and um, we would be engaged under an underdevelopment management agreement to develop to, to, to develop a site out for them. So it would be a forward sale to a pension site or, or something like that. So that's a good way to de-risk developments by firstly achieving pre-sales on them early, but also selling into a market which is arguably more stable than the residential market is at the moment. And so I guess this philosophy that we adopt with um, uh, enhancement on development sites um, allows us to de-risk in, in multiple fashions. So we de-risk by building additional margin into it, but we also de-risk by focusing on, on sectors that are not currently so volatile. It's worth saying that this project is, is it's a joint venture with a, with a family office who are effectively a private equity fund, um, but we are likely also to um, crowdfund some of these money into this project as well. So some key takeaways from that. Um, look for the opportunity behind every problem. That planning can was a very poorly thought out planning consent. And so if you looked at it based on implementing it, you'd think that's a nightmare. What the opportunity that we saw in that planning consent was because it was so poorly thought out that there was lots of opportunity to optimise it and, and get additional floor space, look at alternative uses, and by doing that, maximise the value of the site. So I think if you look at problems in the right way, they can, they can be turned into, into opportunities, into upside. 
And that's why I don't shy away from looking at difficult sites. And by the way, this site um, was originally put up um, for, for sale via an agent. Um, we were the underbidder on it. So the first bidder um, bid, uh, I think, something like 10.2 million on it. We, we put a bid in, I think, at 9.6. Um, once the, once they, um, they accepted the, the, the higher bidder's bid, and they got solicitors engaged, um, the higher bidder started looking in detail at, at the planning permission and the issues associated with the site and effectively pulled out straight away. They decided we don't, we don't want anything to do with this because of, because of these problems. So it came back to us and we were then effectively the only party that the vendor was speaking to. Because of the issues associated with the site, we were able to knock the price down from 9.6 million to 8.7 million. And that's the price that we exchanged at. So I think you can find that with sites that have problems, because they put other people off, you can often find yourself in a position where you're the only game in town if you're able to understand and deal with and cope with the risks associated with those, with those problems. And that's, that's certainly the case with us. Um, so if it's difficult to work out, it's going to put other people off. Um, patience is the key. Sometimes the best sites are those which have been hanging around for a long time. We actually ended up taking around about 12 months from when we first looked at the site to exchange contracts on it. But that's partly because we, we once we got engaged with the vendor, the vendor realised that because the site was so difficult, if he started from scratch with somebody else, he was going to take another four, five, six months to actually get to the point where somebody was ready to exchange. Sites which are newly on the market uh, are often overpriced, and I've, I've touched on that already. I think it's very important not to allow yourself to be rushed or pushed, so you need to keep a, a calm state of mind. If the deal doesn't work, then walk away from it, and just find a way to make it work. But there's lots of other sites out there, just because the one that you're looking at doesn't work, if it doesn't work, then, then you know, perhaps just file it, put an offer at a level that works for you, walk away from it, and spend your time focusing on something else. Um, again, think slowly but act quickly, and I think this principle for us goes all the way through our development activity from site acquisition through to development. Um, and look for the things which everyone else has missed. On that particular site, if you just focused on the existing consent and what could be done with that consent, you would have missed an immense amount of value. So, um, if you want to get involved with what we're doing, um, we have recently launched a bond. It's a property-backed bond. Um, this is, if, if, if people are interested in getting involved in future equity investment opportunities that we, um, that we offer, and we will be offering an investment um, opportunity on this um, Clapham Road site, um, what bondholders receive is um, a 10% re return on funds that they put into the bond. Um, that's secured by a second charge against our investment property portfolio, but it's a convertible bond. So, so in essence, what investors um, receive is priority access to future investment opportunities and an enhanced rate of return on those opportunities. If anyone's interested in that, come and have a chat to me about it afterwards. Um, so we've already raised around about £300,000 on that bond, um, but as I said, it's, it's, a, it's designed as a place for people who are interested in getting involved in our projects to effectively launch some money and get priority access to those opportunities. Um, just, to, just to finish things off, um, what I want to say is that we, we, we structure our properties, projects so as to minimise risk and maximise return, but if you think that's what it's all about, you've missed the point. Um, what really drives me is making a difference to the places that our developments are built in. I, get, uh, I, well, I can only call an intangible sense of satisfaction from having stepped back and completed a project and seeing the impact that it's made on the place that it's built. Um, I think for me, it, in a way, it's about making my mark on the world. So um, one of the things that, I, that, I, that I've done is that I've taken a lot of very ugly properties and converted them into nice looking properties. So, taking the worst property on the street and leaving it as the best property in the street. You make a tangible improvement to that place, or building a building that at least I think from a design point of view is, is something beautiful and makes an impact on the place that it's built. And so for me, seeing people use those spaces and seeing people, um, uh, seeing that impact on people's lives is something that for me um, really drives what I do. And so I guess the, the way that I'd like to sum that up is that what we stand for is delivering inspiring buildings that make a positive impact on the place that they're built in, and which can contain living spaces which are designed by the way people live their lives. 
So um, thank you for listening. I hope you found that, uh, that useful. I'm being told to stop. So um, I'll be on the mastermind tables if you guys have got any more questions, then um, happy to ask them. Thank you.